The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. You start going in too many different uh, directions. You're going to end up chasing everything and having nothing. You won't accomplish anything. You can't stay focused. Your mind is bogged down. You get uh, anxious, full of anxieties, all sorts of things. And then ultimately, you're off focus. Then you get caught off guard by the things that will most certainly come. We have lots of prophecy that will be fulfilled. I was taking, I was looking at uh, some of the prophecies in some of the books that people don't like to read, like Estras, like Baruch. Listen to this. These are some of the prophecies found in that book that are promised to happen during the last days. The sun is going to shine in the night. The moon is going to uh, shine three times in the night. Blood will drop out of wood. Stones will sing. People will be troubled. People will rule. Or in other words, unqualified folks are going to start ruling, but are not qualified to rule in the first place. Birds will f start flying all at one time. Confusion will be in many places. Fire will be sent out throughout the world. Back and forward, fire will go, burning up everything in its past. Wild beasts will change their places. And we know that's a disruption of migrations. Menstruous women shall bring forth monsters. That's when people are deformed in their minds. So, you know, imagine people having a bunch of Hitlers or characters like that. That's also happening. Salt water is going to be found in fresh water. That salt water intrusion. Friends will destroy one another. Wit or courage is going to hide itself. Understanding will withdraw itself to secret chambers and will be sought by many. So people will desire to have understanding, but they will not have understanding. Unrighteousness and inconsistency will be multiplied upon the earth. One land also will ask another and say, Is righteousness that makes a man righteous gone through thee? And it shall say no. So lands will say there's no righteousness here. There's only wickedness here. And that's happening already. Men will hope, but nothing obtained. Men will labor, but their ways shall not prosper. There will be a beginning of commotions. A stupor shall seize the inhabitants of the earth. When they say that the Lord no longer remembers the earth, then tribulation will come. The slaying of the great ones, that will certainly take place. That means all your governors and your presidents, people will begin to slay them. They'll have great indignation towards all of their leaders. In fact, it's not a good time for a leader to be a leader because people are going to turn on them, get them in trouble, have them put in jail, every single last one of them. Many will fall by death, the descending of the sword, that's from the heavens upon people. That means war is going to break out, and it's not going to end until Jesus puts it into it. Famine and the withholding of rain. Earthquakes will be all over the place. Specters specters which are uh spirits are going to come there will also come the attack of the shadim that's when manifestations of spiritual entities begin to attack people there will be the fall of fire there will be much oppression wickedness and chastity will be throughout all lands confusion from all the aforesaid items in fact in the book of uh in the book of uh, baruch it says that so that uh, only the wise can track prophecy. None of those things will be in order. One will help another. One will lead to another, which means all will begin to happen at one time so that it overwhelms everybody. Also, when I was reading Baruch, the glory of Zion was taken out of the earth, but it would not be stained, and it only comes back with the Messiah. That was so beautiful when I read that. I, I read some there's, some, there's some wonderful things in there. Men will not contaminate the order of the Lord. They, they, they won't do it. No spirit is going to contaminate the order of the Lord. And when the glory of Zion comes back with Christ, men's minds will instantly change. Truth will flood the earth like a deluge. And people will stop in their tracks doing what they're doing. Many will feel guilty and condemned because they will feel the truth. Many who, are, who have been stricken in the earth will be instantly vindicated those who loved the Lord. So justice will come, not men's justice, which is corrupt and crooked, biased, and for, you know, whatever cause they want it to be for. But heavenly justice will come with the Messiah. That's coming. It is not here yet. That's why so many people get away with things. And this is a good time to encourage everybody to remember these prophecies, to remember that the Lord's justice is coming to this earth. It's almost like every day I hear people, they make reference to the living God, even by scripture, and they do not want to mention Christ. They don't. And I'll tell you right now,
right now, you better be wary of anybody who would have you learn something in the Word of God and leave Christ off. If they don't speak about his sacrifice, if they don't speak about his gospel, you might want to turn the other direction. Because I've heard people talk about God. You don't know what God they're talking about. We just, you know, sometimes people assume they're talking about the God of Abraham, you know, Jacob and all those guys. Wrong. They could be talking about mammon. When they don't mention Christ, they have not properly identified what God they're talking about. And why would they leave off Christ anyway in a conversation? How can Christ be left off any teaching anybody would ever give? I've seen people identify prophets above Christ. And then they even put down Christ. I've heard that. I've heard people talk for long sessions. They will not mention Jesus of Nazareth. They won't do it. There's a spirit at work in this world. And it's not our Father's spirit. It is allowed to work during this time to bring everything to a full consummation. That's why darkness is in the earth. Everything must be brought to a full consummation. Everything God spoke must come to its full measure. That's what you see happening before your eyes. No prophecy from the living God will fail. No principle, Christ, spoke, will falter. And everybody, believe it or not, you live under the word of the Messiah. He dictates, or he does not dictate. He allows, or he does not allow. Why? Because all authority has been handed to the Messiah. All of it. And this fear of the earth desires to circumvent the Messiah, to usurp his authority. By words, they do so. By actions, they do so. In truth, they cannot. When you say a prayer, your prayers go through the Messiah first, and then they're presented to the Most High. Nothing we do direct can go to the Most High, except it go through Christ first. All things must go through the blood before it reaches the living God. We cannot go directly to God Almighty, except through Christ Jesus. And because of the blood, God does not see our sin in our times of prayer, in our times of praise. But He sees His Son with everything we do. And without the Son, every single last one of us are condemned. Not one of us could make it based on our own merits. Without the Son, all of us are doomed. And we can't get rid of our own sin. Only by way of the blood could we ever be redeemed. So all those who reject the Messiah, who reject the cross, and to reject the Messiah means you have to have knowledge of him, not just know about him. You have to understand what the cross is. You have to actually say, no, I don't want the sacrifice. Those who do that, there's no hope for them, and they are already condemned. But for those who believe upon the name, Jesus of Nazareth, who truly believe in the gospel, he stood for. Because of him, there's no condemnation towards you. It does not matter what you've done in your past. It matters if you accept that sacrifice of Yahshua HaMashiach. It matters if you believe in his gospel. See, a lot of people will not talk about sacrifice. They won't talk about forgiveness. They won't talk about love. They count those as weak when that's the basis of the gospel. And in these days we live in, they're changing it. A hybrid gospel has raised its head. A hybrid gospel, that word gospel means good news. So a hybrid gospel is an alternate good news. Something that's very inclusive, certain principles of Christ, but has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And just as the media would spin every story, so do the minds of many spin every truth they see, causing people to believe in more and more lies. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the anchor in Christ Jesus, because all of us would be lost without him. He is the only anchor we could ever hope to have. And by the way, the Lord has given all of us a scent, a basic spiritual senses, gifts, if you will. But the question is, are we operating by them? Do we actually utilize them? Or do we override them by way of our minds? Your mind can override what the Lord has given you. Your mind can. And how many times, I want you to look at this in a realistic way. How many times have you had the truth? For example, the direction you're going. Maybe something in you, everything in you is going to go left. The thing you thought about it. You begin to think about the weather. You begin to think about everything else. And you made a decision with all of what you could draw upon. And you went right only to find that going right was the wrong decision. How many have done that? In other words, you have the truth in the beginning, but as soon as your mind kicked in, as soon as logic kicked in, you chose wrong. How many have done that? Einstein spoke about that at great, great length, trying to identify the mechanism. That's why he became humble at the end of his days, attempting to solve something that he couldn't. 
but he came to that same conclusion. Many of the great scientists came to the same conclusion. They conceded that something external from them was giving them what they had, but that their own minds betrayed them. They conceded that, and that's something, but if you like to brag on the mental faculties of your mind, which by the way is a carnal mind, carnal means of your natural body, your natural mind, right? That brain that you have up there, that's a carnal mind. In the Bible, it says the carnal mind is against God. What other mind do you have? There's only one other mind spoken of in the word of God. Do you know what that is? The mind of Christ. To have the mind of Christ is to have the spirit of the living God indwelling within you. And then you operate by the mind of Christ. Otherwise, you operate by your carnal mind, which is against the living God. I know that's hard to make that distinction. I know it's hard to bridge the gap because a lot of people would instantly ask, well, then what is the mind for? For common things, that's what it's for. For you to overcome, that's what it's for. Just as we are to walk by the Spirit, not after those things of the flesh, so are we to graduate from utilizing our carnal mind into the mind of Christ, which means a spiritual walk. Your body should be under submission to your spirit through Christ. If not, you're an animal, and we all know that, because we have animalistic ways. Look at the carnage in the world. Look what they seek in the world to destroy each other to rule over one another. Without Christ, without the spiritual mind, there's only chaos and darkness. Satan already exists in that domain. But with Christ, there is peace. There's a godly order. There's light. That's with your spiritual mindset, with the subduance of the flesh, my way of Christ. And all those abilities, both good and bad, reside within you. But what are you using? Tonight's title is, tonight's uh, title, what we're going to talk about is using what God has given. Using what he has given. But what set do you utilize? God initially gave man flesh. Man became a living soul when God breathed the breath of life into him. Now, we don't understand the entirety of that process. But we do know that man became a living soul, which is essentially a person walking around who is a spirit that inhabits this reality by way of the body. So your spirit is in the body. You put those two together, well then you have something walking around, interacting with everything bound to this earth, but you are in fact a spirit in that body, a soul. God gave you gifts in the flesh, and people exercise those gifts all the time, sometimes in a very cruel way. But I also gave you gifts of the spirit. Just as you have, you can walk, you can talk, and these things are common among human beings. So is he giving you spiritual things like discernment, like spiritual sight? But the question is, what do you utilize? What do you depend upon? Because a lot of people in this day and age, they depend upon their flesh attempting to resolve spiritual things. And it doesn't work out so well. In the Bible it says, thinking themselves wise, they become fools. Thinking themselves to be wise. What is that? How do you think yourself to be wise? That's when you honestly believe that you have more knowledge than somebody else. You've already messed up when you do that. If you had all the knowledge of men, that's not going to save your soul. If you were a rocket scientist, you're not going to be the most useful person given all the different errors that we've had on the earth. <clears throat> somebody says, Michael, we dedicate all, even our job, in our limits, we fail. Why? We come up short because of what we rely upon. What you rely upon is always going to be your outcome. And I'll tell you this, we do not 100% rely upon the Spirit. Whatever we rely upon, that's what we end up utilizing. Whatever we utilize is going to depart understanding in ways to us. We end up adopting those things we utilize, becoming one with it. That always yields an outcome in failure, right? But what is failure? Partway through this conversation, you may want to readapt that term failure. Because in what way do people fail? See, only Christ can tell us if we have failed or not. So in truth, we don't know if we failed. A lot of people think they have failed, and they have not. They failed to meet somebody else's standard. Don't chase somebody else's standards. You are your own individual, your standard bearer. So in other words, the Lord gives you things. You create the standard. You don't measure yourself by way of somebody else. Don't look at your neighbor and say, because you're short, you've already failed. Don't do that. Failure is something that we define in our shortcomings in view of everybody else. We're not here to compare ourselves to everybody else. So failure has to be redefined. Because if we don't do that, if we don't redefine failure, put it back in perspective, 
take those principles of Christ and begin to live by them so that we can see things like this. We're going to continue failing. We're going to think we fail all the time. We're going to start, we're going to use that language, believe that language, and then operate in a type of failure. First and foremost, you're not a failure. God never said that to you. The Lord never said that to you. Only Satan says that. And Satan will say that to everybody else that he can utilize. The Lord never said that. The Lord said you're more than conquerors. That's exactly what he said. So how can you be a failure and a conqueror at the same time? And he said you're more than conquerors through Christ, through him. So how can you be a failure? What has truly happened is we gauge our lives of others around us. We look in a mirror and disregard what we see. That's what we do. We disregard what we see. We're not content with what the Lord has given us and what we have. We set our eyes upon somebody else. They become our standard and we try to meet what they have. That develops a pattern of covetousness. And that's not the truth. You'll live in depression if you believe that. You'll be very depressed when you believe that. So you're not a failure. In fact, there's a different way to see that. And it's with spiritual eyes. And it should be utilized. It'd be a good thing to be utilized by all who believe in Christ. No longer to live their lives by this worldly, <clears throat> worldly thing. For example, why do you wear the clothing that you wear? A lot of people say, well, I'm original. No, you're not, because somebody else made your clothes. Somebody else designed your clothes. One person said, no, I designed my own clothes. I said, okay, but you're driving somebody else's car. You're catching up with somebody else's job. Everything that we do, we mimic somebody else. But why? Why do we do that? Because you're a cog. You're a little cog, a little tooth in a gear. That gear has been here for a long time. It's developed by mankind. And they teach you how to grow to be the best tooth you can be so that you can work as a portion of that machine to keep it going. That's what you're being trained to do. Television. All the television shows that they ever show, that they have ever showed, support the ideology to teach you, to train you, to program you to be a good cog in the gear, in the machine. That's what they do. The news, right? Teaches you how to interpret information, doesn't it? I want you to, everybody think about this. If I give you news and I start talking about an earthquake, if I say, hey, we had a 7.0 earthquake today, everybody goes and they look at the earthquake and find, but they see, that's not enough. I'll say we had a 7.0 earthquake and uh, as we had that earthquake, it's showing us how everything is falling apart. Now, listen to what I'm doing. I'm just giving you guys an example. When we discuss things with each other, often we'll give a fact followed by some sort of forecasting of what we think is going to happen, which is not necessarily bad. Now, to talk about an earthquake, that's one thing. But when you start talking about people, when you start talking about politics, when you start talking about your lifestyle, where can I go with that? I can't go anywhere with that unless I'm trying to program you to follow the steps I'm creating. See, what I'm trying to tell you is that news organizations are paid big money for a reason. News ratings have gone way down. Who's paying, who's paying for that stuff? Anybody know? Who's paying for it? Commercials? What you buy? Stores are giving kickbacks? That's who's paying for it. You wouldn't see movies on television without commercials, without programming. Programming you is what the world does. That's what they're interested in. You have a commercial. They tell you, hey, you need to buy this. You need this. This will make you uh, look better in front of everybody else. Haven't you noticed in the advertising? They show you an individual that you want to be. They get you to buy something, and you think you're going to be that person if you buy it, or certainly be in better favor, a, a favorable position with everybody else. That's a high form of witchcraft. When you create a need within a person that was never there in the first place, we call it programming. Back in the day, that was called witchcraft. It's exercised every single day, and we fall for it. People go out and get that special top. They go out and get those special shoes. They get that particular car. And they really adopt the attitude, and they grab hold of that commercial. And they start to fill in the character they saw, thinking that's who they're going to be. But something happens when they fall short, when nobody accepts them like they thought they would be accepted. When their performance is not like they showed it, their performance does not match up to what they showed on television or to what somebody programmed you with. Then we say the magic words, I failed. No, what we're truly saying is that I failed to meet the standard of the world again. I failed to meet the standard of my programming. We are not artificial intelligence computers. How can you fail? And what exactly are you failing? Can one person tell me? 
What exactly are you failing? You starting to see it? Anybody starting to see it? That when we say I fail, we're actually saying I didn't meet the standard of what I just saw. I didn't meet the standard of what everybody else expects. You notice how Christ is not in this conversation whatsoever. Do you notice that? Because how many of you have even taken that over to your Christian walk and said, Lord, I failed you. How so did you fail? He knows you're an infant. He knows you're going to fall when you walk. You're learning to walk. How did you fail? Failure spiritually is something that that word that people use based off the world's teachings. We can't do that. We can't even afford to continue to do that. You can't, we can't afford to adopt the teachings of the world that cause us to walk with our heads down spiritually. I said this before and I'll say it again. Satan does not care if you read your Bibles. Satan does not care if you talk about Christ in your home all day. Satan cares when you affect change, God's change in the earth. Satan cares if you step into your calling because you are a threat to him when you do that. You're no threat to him. If you go to the same church every single day and nothing in that church ever gets outside those walls, Satan doesn't care. He didn't care about that. Let him stay in there and serve each other. So long as they don't spread that stuff to the world, he didn't care. But the moment you step out of bounds, the moment you step out of the ring somebody put you in, that's when he cares. Anybody ever go beyond what everybody else expects? That's when people come out and they say, what are you doing? Well, I'm stepping over this line, this barrier. Well, you can't do that. That's the first thing people will say. You can't do that. Well, why not? Well, because uh, nobody does that. The very thing nobody does is exactly what God called you to do. He did not call you to retire in the pews. That's not what he called you for. He didn't call you to sit in the pews all day long, all night long, so your butt is square at the end. That's not what he called you for. He called you to get up and to effect change in the world. You have a higher calling. Who's going to hear it? Who's going to walk outside of what you're programmed to stay inside of? We're kind of like gerbils or hamsters. We get on the wheel. You know that hamster wheel? And we think we're doing something. Look at me. I'm running fast. But you're going nowhere. You're doing what others did before you. The wheel has been there for years. You've only been there for months. And you're running your heart out going nowhere. The Lord called you to get out of that cage. And then to come back and tell others, hey, you don't have, don't stand there. Come out here. That's not the world. Open your eyes and follow me. Let's go. The Lord called you to effect change. And, and through history, you have people who have done this. In every single case, when they step out of the bounds of their programming, what happens? Everybody comes against them. Everybody says they're idiots. Everybody casts them down. Why? Because they're breaking the programming. The walking outside of the confines that they call safety. And they're walking by faith into something else. And listen, when you walk into the unknown, there is no standard because nobody's out there. Nobody's going to tell you you're supposed to do it this way. You're supposed to do it that way. Nope. You just walked into the land where the supposed tos don't exist. You're called to do that. You're not called to stay within man's programming. You're called to go above and beyond. Why do you think you burn so much inside and you're never satisfied accomplishing anything of mankind? You get to a point where you know yourself. You say, I know there's, that God is calling me for greater things, but where is it? And all the while, we're still operating by our programming. You're living your life according to what you've seen on television, what your parents have seen on television and through radio and through other people, what they've been trained to live like. Well, you go live in this neighborhood, you cut your grass, keep up, keep on your house, and you have made it wrong. No, you haven't. You're living by programming of the flesh, not even of the spirit. Some people get the word. Well, you get the word and you go talk to everybody about the word this way and that way. They start doing that and then they wonder why nobody likes it. No one likes me because I tell the truth. No, nobody likes you because you're trying to get everybody to think how you think. Nobody wants to hear that. The truth is your spirit desires to be free from that programming. Your spirit desires something real, something authentic. And every time it does not come, your frustration adds up. It's almost like your spirit just says, oh, no more food today. No food today again. No water today again. And it does hunger and thirst for righteousness. It will not be filled by a multitude of words. In this case, it requires us to command the body to get up, break the programming, and start walking right behind Christ. I can assure you that Jesus Christ is not walking around in circles in your neighborhood. That's not what's happening. 
You have people that come around with a dead word that will try to keep you within the programming, and they're in the church, the religious ones. They say, never go outside of this line and never go outside of that line. You stay right here, you're good. And they give you their seal of approval to make you think you're doing something. You don't need man's seal of approval, but something happens as soon as you break the programming. It's very scary because when you break the programming, everybody says, what are you doing? You're corrupted. I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Isn't that what they say? When you guys were at home and you start talking about spiritual things, they say, what are you doing? Surely you don't believe in that crazy stuff, do you? You don't believe in that prophecy stuff, do you? You don't believe in that stuff the way they put it about Revelation, do you? Because that's part of the programming kicking in. And everybody who's programmed, they're also programmed to keep you within the program. But when you start to break it, they react instantly. What happens at that moment? You can either go forward with your programming and say, Jimmy Crack Corn, and I don't care, I'm following Christ. Not you. Or you can submit. Most people submit. They'll say, yeah, well, you're right. But in, in, internally, they believe exactly what they just said. But so that nobody else gets upset, they relent. Don't they? They relent, go back into their corner, and then they go back to a deadness. You guys know what that deadness is. You're not satisfied. You're not content or anything else. Because you're wanting to break out of that deadness. You feel the death all around you. You feel it's dead. And you never understood it. How can people who believe in Christ also be complacent with a dead place? Something in you wants to break out. Here's what you don't know. As soon as you break the bonds, as soon as you break those bonds, and somebody says, you don't believe in that crazy stuff, do you? You say, you know what? I believe every word of Yahshua HaMashiach. I do not believe man's toned down version of anything. I believe it the way God put it in me. I believe it wholeheartedly. As soon as you do that, you break the program. They, they don't know what to say. Then the amazing thing happens. As you continue to go forward, you see that other people have also broke the programming. And that's when the reunions begin. Because you have no idea who else has broken that programming. Right now, how many of you think you're free? You're free because you're not in jail. Wrong. Just because you're not in jail doesn't mean you're free. Because many of you have a prison at home. Many of you have a prison at work. You're bound to it. You're bound to so many things within this machine that you've forgotten that you're uh, about your imprisonment in the first place, which means you're bound by the machine mankind has made. This machine that took on a life of its own. This machine that does not need a specific individual. It's like the rule of law. Whether people are there to enforce it or not, somebody's going to stand up for the rule of law. It essentially has a life on its own. Society will demand that people follow the rule of law. But you know what the problem with the rule of law is? The rule of law is flawed by those immoral individuals who have incorporated their ideologies in it. Your life is just it is exactly the same way. And here's what happens to a Christian when you agree to stay within the confines, the safety of humanity. When you seek safety, the safety of humanity, which means you agree to stay exactly where you are, not grow, not go beyond, not walk by faith, not breach those, those barriers. When you agree to stay there, you're being held. You have to follow a specific system. You can never go beyond the bounds. It's just like being in prison. You're behind bars. The Lord came to free us of such. Not so you can run out the country. Not so you can run in the middle of a street, be a rebel in front of everybody else. That's not what we're talking about. No, we're talking about living by the standards of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Utilizing what God has given you and live your life that way. Instead of utilizing the weapons mankind has given you to keep you somehow satisfied enough that you stay within the prisons you agreed to stay in. We talked about some of this yesterday. People agreed to stay in those situations. There are guards to this prison I'm talking about, and those guards will enforce what people call common sense on everybody else. Having heard somebody say, use your common sense, revelation, that stuff in revelation is not literal. Haven't you heard that before? Well, guess what? I don't have common sense. Common sense is an ability common to everybody. God gave me something else, and he gave you something else. But if you choose to use your common mind, you're living within the confines of a very programmed society. And we all know what's going to happen to it. It's just like a lot of people say, well, the beast system is coming. The beast system is already set up. It's already here. It's just that the one has not been appointed to it yet. What's the opposite of a beast system, a godly system? What godly system exists on the earth? You name one kingdom on the earth that is of the living God that carries the traits of Jesus Christ. Go ahead, tell me. One society. There is none. 
All are made by men. Men's laws, men's ways, men's culpability in, in half the things they're doing. All by men. And people who believe in the living God. People who agree with love and forgiveness. People who have strength are still tormented internally. Kept bound. It's time to break those bounds. It's time to walk out. You'll never learn that from the systems you're engaged in. You'll never learn that from the prison. Even the angels had to open the doors of, 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 of the apostles' prison. The angels opened the door. I'll tell you right now, the Lord will open those doors. The question is, will you walk out or stay there? You're going to stay in the same spot. Listen, remember with your mind, because I'll tell you something. God has opened the prison doors more than once, and you did not come out. When he opened the prison doors, now think very hard. When he opened the prison doors, you know what many of you said? Well, if I go, I'm going to have no security. Well, if I go, I don't know what I'm going to do for shelter. Well, if I go, I don't know this and I don't know that. And because of insecurities, what did you do? You went right back into the prison. Do you know why? Because when the prison is open, the only way out is by faith. That's the only way out. You have no securities of the eye when you're walking by faith. Because to walk by faith, you have to operate by the spirit. You have to utilize your spiritual mindset, not your physical mindset. Many people never got out. The doors were opened and they stayed and they said to themselves the same thing that they said when they were freed from Egypt. They said, at least we had meals there. At least we knew what to expect. Yes, it was harsh. Yes, I was beaten. But at least we knew where, what we were doing every day. And people have been programmed so deeply. That has become the very comfort that competes with faith. Many of you will not be free because you see no provision outside of where you are. How do you break that? What is the process of the breaking of that? Well, let me tell you, it's the same process that happened in the desert. The exact same process we discussed last night. The same thing that happened to the apostles. Remember, with the apostles, and this is sobriety, this is not illusion, but upon being set free, the apostles were still beaten, but then they were freed in the joy of the Holy Ghost. Come on now, somebody. This is not, we're not talking about theory. This isn't, well, let's try this and see if it works and try this and see if it works. No, that's why the Bible is so incredible. It is very incredible because the processes are all the same from the beginning to the very end. And indeed, if you start to employ those processes, you're going to have the exact same results, the exact same results. And guess what? The end is what victory That's what the end is. It takes a consideration. See, many of you, you've already, you've already been hit. You've taken some blows. You've already done that. Yet somehow you're convinced that you can't move forward because of some discomfort. So you would sit in the chair of discomfort for many years, being afraid of discomfort. Come on, somebody has to know what I'm talking about. How can we sit in a chair of pain and yet we're frightened of pain? We stay in the prison of discomfort and pain, but then we won't get out because we'll say, well, if I get out, I might face some discomfort or pain. You've gone through it since you were put here on this earth. And do you know what the principle of our Father is? Hmm? The first will be last, and the last will be first. The greatest is the least, and the least is the greatest. Anybody understand what that is? Why so many examples of that? You, you know what you could equate that to? That everyone is going to experience both being last and being first. Everyone is going to experience being least and being greatest. How so, you may say, for a person who's given a billion dollars at birth and they're the richest person there ever was, later on in life, they start to struggle with their health and everything else. When they struggle with their health and their relationships fall apart, the billions they have means nothing. So they become least at the end, though they were greatest at the beginning. But the great part, they don't even recall, they don't consider why, because the weight of the health problems, the weight of the emptiness outweighs that greatness. So they experience that too. Someone who's had it hard in life at the beginning, they have also noticed something. They've had it hard at, in the beginning and they've remembered that hardship all throughout their lives. But, their, but life itself for them, they have been graced a great many things. They have been put in positions that the other person has not. They have been handed things the other person has not. If you don't, if you suffer in the beginning, and it's a durational suffering. It gets easier and easier as life goes on until it ceases totally. If you've not suffered in the beginning, you're going to suffer at the end. In other words, 
all of us are going to go through what the Lord said we're going to go through. But he took your life and he expanded your life. Most of you have gone through things early. Many of you continue to go through small things. Why? Because he took your process and he stretched it out so that it would not consume you. There's a time coming for many of you that have suffered for so long. Did you know that in the Bible it says that healing is with him? Oh my. That when the Messiah comes, his healing is with him. That when this process is done, when it's almost over, you're going to stand better than the other guy. Why? God is no respecter of persons. One is not above the other in his eyes. And we've all been enduring some sort of process. Those who have escaped everything early, they must go through it now. Those who have had things early, they'll be freed from it now. Do you see that? So everybody will learn. Everybody will see. Everybody will know. And by the way, no one will go to hell without truly understanding the Messiah and the cross and the process. Everybody must come to that understanding, though everybody will not choose it. Understanding the bigger part of your process will help you to utilize what the Lord put in you. Understanding where you are will help you make a decision by faith to utilize what God has already put within you. He is giving you masterful gifts in you. But so long as you choose to stay in bondage, you will not use them. Then your mind is overcome by those things you see most often. And soon you'll say it's impossible for a person to do this or that. But you're sent here on this earth to walk by faith, not by sight. You know what that means? Wherever you are right now, you're promised to go up from there with the Lord. So the key, the key, the key is learning the Lord's process for yourself. Not through my words, not through somebody else's words, but to examine closely the walk of Christ and walk with him. Walk with the Lord. See, we've already done this with the world, have we not? We've examined every news article. We've examined how things work in the world. We know the pulse of the world. We do, we do, we know it. We're programmed with it. Time to adopt everything of Christ. The same way you learned all these things of the world, seek to know your Messiah with that same persistence, with that same trust. Those who don't really trust the Messiah, who can't really have faith, you're trusting in the world right now. That's why you can't trust in the Messiah. You cannot have two masters. You're going to be loyal to one and despise the other. That is true. And if you're loyal to the world, you're going to despise certain characteristics of Christ. But now is your time. The same way you allow the programming of yourselves by the world, the same way you believe in all these things of the world that compete with believing in things by faith, this is your time to put the Messiah first and say, okay, Lord, the same way I was programmed by the world and indeed was loyal to it working within its systems and trusting its outcomes and its ways and its methodologies, I'm going to do you. I'm going to walk behind you, Lord. Pursue the Lord just like you pursued half the dreams you had in the world. The big difference is this. With the world, you can always lose. No matter how righteous a cause you think something is, with the world, you can lose. No matter how just something is, you can lose in the world. No matter how good the act, you can lose in the world. But with the Lord, you cannot lose. See, a lot of people, they have adapted themselves to all these methods of the world, and they try to employ them with their walk spiritually with Christ. And it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, they say, well, this must mean something else because this is not working for me or I just can't see it this way. It's not based on what you can see. The beauty of it is this. Your eye hath not seen. You can't forecast the outcome of the Lord, but you can walk by faith. You can't say what will and won't be with the Lord, but you can walk by faith. In other words, you can start focusing on him instead of believing every pundit on the news. Believe in the leading of the Holy Spirit, no longer denying it. Because we can all say God gives us the truth. But as soon as our minds get involved, we choose the error, don't we? We choose the wrong way. And after we find out we have chosen the wrong way due to our own intellect, then we say, I should have, I should have stayed with the first thought. We don't like to follow it. We always tend to follow those things that we can say we did. So when you end up at the right place, you'll say, yes, that's because I chose right. Time to get beyond that. When you end up at the right place, if you abandon all of that programming from the world, when you end up at the right place, you know what you'll say? By the Lord's leading, by his grace and mercy, I'm here. With the world, you poke out your chest and you say, I got here because I, I have worked hard and did this and here. This is all about you. Only to end up failing right after that. With the Lord, not so. You'll tell anybody and everybody. 
the Lord led me here. He's very gracious and led me here. They may ask you, well, did you endure any hardships? I did, and he brought me through them all. See how that works? With the world, they've taught you something else. They've taught you to defend your own works, didn't they? They taught you to defend it. And I'll tell you right now, you'll defend it vigorously. Didn't matter if you're a Christian or not as part of your programming. So if you were to do something, let's say, for example, you had a plan. You had a plan for COT and I said, okay, look, we're going to try that plan. And we do that plan and everything works out beautiful. And I never mention your name. You're going to be a bit bothered by that. You're going to start moving in the wrong way by that because you know it was your plan. And if I don't mention your name, you're going to have thoughts in your head. Oh, he's trying to act like he came up with that plan. He didn't come up with that. And true to form, at some point, you're going to tell somebody that wasn't him. That was me. I had that plan. See, because the world teaches you how to defend those small things you do accomplish. With the Lord, it's not so. You know, with the Lord, I can have a plan right now and I can give that plan to somebody. And when it works out for their life, there's nothing in me that will ever claim any of that work. But all I would say is, thank you, Lord. With the Lord, you can actually be in joy for somebody else in truth. Not some fleeting joy. No, it's a different type of joy. With the world, they teach you to defend all of your works, to utilize them for a resume for something else. What do you think people say when, when you talk to them about things, right? Especially the Bible. And you say, well, no, it, it, it's not that way. And they say, well, I used to teach Bible study for 90 years. People start giving a resume. They start supporting their worth because nobody of the world wants you to take their worth away. People work very hard to build up a worth. And that's what they're concerned about. Here's the sad part. If you give a person all of what they're actually worth, and it may look like a lot to them, they're still not free because they're always going to crave more. There's always going to come a case where you have to reprove yourself again and again and again. When people first come into Christianity, one of the first things they try to do is to make everybody else understand that they matter. Some people join a body of Christ. They get so overwhelmed that people have accepted them for who they are. They start doing weird things to try and make other people believe, right? Or feel that they matter, that they have some relevance. Listen, no one here need ever prove that you have relevance here. All of you are critical. You don't have to emulate anybody. You don't have to go the extra mile to put somebody down to make you seem higher than the other person. See, by way of the Holy Spirit, you're seen for who you really are. And who you really are, no one can take away from you. Even you can't see fully who you are. But by the Holy Spirit, it can be seen, which makes all of you critical, highly favorable and favored. You never have to prove anything here. People, the world teaches you and programs you to operate in certain ways. And if you operate in those ways, you'll never utilize what the Lord has given you. But if you would observe what the world has programmed you to do and seek to walk away from it and to follow Christ, it's very different. See, with Christ, you can forgive everybody. Without Christ, it's very difficult to forgive, isn't it? With Christ, you'll have it in your heart that nobody owes you anything. Without Christ, you'll constantly say that somebody owes you an apology. Without Christ, you're constantly offended with Christ. You can take all of what a person heaps upon top of you and the love you have for them never fades. That's true liberty. In the Bible, it says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Freedom is only found where the spirit of the Lord is. And this is about breaking the bondage for the time of times raises its head because it will. And although this conversation is passive in a lot of ways, it's for you to consider some things because you're going to find yourself in a position of great degradation soon. No one will escape it. No one's going to fare well with this. See, in the Bible, it says God makes it. It rains on the just as well as the unjust. All of us are going to go through the same circumstances. But the outcome of those who believe in Christ is going to be ultimately victorious. Leave the methodology up to the most time. Soon the skies will change. Not one person is going to remember how they looked at the skies tonight or today. You won't remember that when the skies do change. You'll quickly forget what they ever looked like. Everybody will be on guard. When the new elements are introduced and an oppressive darkness finally rises, everybody will know it. Wickedness will increase so fast. If you think the world is wicked now, you've been sadly mistaken. Ladies, you have to get yourselves into position with the Messiah expediently. You can't even afford to play around. And gentlemen, a permanent penalty 
will be upon your heads if you choose unrighteousness during these times to come. The Lord's not playing games. It took countless generations to prepare us to be here. Your mother had to be here. Your grandparents had to be here. Your lineage had to come into being on this earth to get you here. It was no easy task, but you are here, and there's something God called you for. The question is, will you choose his calling or continue to let the world snuff out your life? Will you be a victim? Continue to be a victim? Or will you stand victorious in Christ? And I'm not talking about claiming something that's not even real. I don't stand up and claim anything that's not absolute. Do you know that? I'm not one of those ones that's going to sit. My arm just fell off and say, I have the victory. I don't do that. That's not me. I'm sorry. That's not me. I walk in the day the Lord presents me with. I do not walk around claiming things. And I don't even know where the Lord has taken me. I don't do that. I don't need to claim anything because I trust in the Messiah. He's not a Messiah of trickery. He's not going to guide me straight into hell itself. That's not who he is. And what he has given to me, nobody can take away. And what he's given to you, nobody can take away. But the world, if you continue to operate by its programming, it'll snuff out the life of the spirit of you. Also keep in mind, many are going to fall away. You're living right at the door. It's almost like that numbness we spoke about is spreading. And it's spreading fast. I'm telling you something that a crisis is coming and it's going to take everybody by surprise. You guys remember here at COT, I used to say, Lord, please don't let me get caught off guard. Remember you guys used to come back, oh, the Lord's not going to let you do that. Just stay strong, Mike. And you really didn't know what I was talking about. The days we live in right now have you numb. They have people numb. I mean numb. It's almost like something has stifled discernment. And unless it's printed, nobody knows about it. There was a time you could almost sense within yourself something went wrong before you looked at the internet. There was no such discernment today. Isn't that something? There was no such discernment yesterday. Something is stifling it. Your discernment even further. And the breakout is weeks away. And people are, people are not in position. Something is zapping your strength. I'll tell you what it is. It's what you're eating what you're consuming. You know what it is? Men do have it right. You are what you eat. Everything you eat, your body breaks it down. Your body becomes, it is added to your body. So you actually become what you eat. In this case, what you're ingesting, what you're ingesting is doing something to you. The numbness is coming from what we are ingesting spiritually. For example, whatever you see with your eyes by way of YouTube, becomes part of your reality. Whatever you hear with your ear becomes part of your reality. If you start ingesting a bunch of worldly stuff mixed with tons of lies, that's going to fight against your spirit. Because your spirit operates in truth, not lies, not deceit. But if we start taking in a bunch of deceit to the point where we believe it, and what I'm talking about is believing what you hear about people in the earth, you got to turn away from that. Have you guys noticed that Christianity has largely turned into what we think about people in the earth? What is that? Have you noticed that the bulk of the conversation now is about what somebody else did or did not do? Something is wrong with that and it's causing us a numbness we never had before. Most people aren't even aware it's causing that type of effect upon them. But people are spiritually numb and that must be lifted. People every day, they're feeling dead spiritually. They're trying everything they can try to light themselves up internally and it's not working. It's because of what we're ingesting. Now think about what you expose yourself to on a daily basis. If you come, now listen, please listen with understanding. When you come and listen to me talk, and I start talking about my opinion of other people, you're listening to opinions. And if those opinions are wrong in any sense, You're ingesting lies from me. Do you hear what I'm saying? And if you ingest lies, you're going to numb your spirit because your spirit is not compatible with lies. Your spirit desires sincere milk, truth. That's what your spirit desires. So if I made this entire conversation about all these people in the world, because I'll be the first to tell you right now, when people start talking about other people in the world, do you know what happens to me? I start slumping. It is the most boring conversation I've ever heard in my life. I don't want to hear about other folks like that. I don't want that in me. I find life in the scriptures. But if I start jumping into this worldly stuff too much, 
it feels like death everlasting. And there is a price to pay for that. Because if you think it's just numbing your discernment, you're wrong. It will engage you and cause you to start speaking about them too. Now in the word it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If you start talking about a subject too much, you're full of that subject. Now thank God to this day, my subject is still about people operating in freedom. It's still about the kingdom of God and of Christ. Because I do find a lot of other subject matter lifeless. And sure enough, when people ingest that lifeless stuff, they become lifeless. When you become lifeless, you also become annoyed and aggravated. It's almost like people around you become intolerable. The love you had in your heart once, it wanes away, it goes away. There's a power at work through what you're hearing. These men that are walking around doing things, they have become a major distraction for the body of Christ. They are all consuming. It seems like something always happens in the world concerning men to absorb the attention of the church to the point where the church does not discuss forgiveness. They don't discuss love. They don't discuss, discuss God's goodness and sobriety of truth like what we read yesterday when the apostles were beaten and then they were set free. Who reads that? Have you ever heard that before? Anybody ever read that before to you? How that they were beaten, then freed, then they rejoiced in the Holy Spirit? How they did not come out of that with no one touching them? That's called sobriety. See, most people don't read things like that. Do you know why? Because they have a premise, well, you're not going to be hurt in anything you do for the Lord. If somebody truly does something for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're not concerned about what's going to hurt them. But you know what's happened to us? We've become so feeble, so brittle by ingesting things that are killing us. It's like ingesting poison, becoming drunk on these things of the world to the point where we become lifeless, saturated, drunken with these things of the world. And people hated Obama, and some people loved Obama. It divided the entire earth, did it not? From the onset, people assigned to him the impossible. They still praise him in some sort of way, or they think he's the devil incarnate. And while they're focused on him, the entire world is falling apart, dealing with other people. Isn't that funny? Why? Because man wants to be right. Hear me on this, guys. What did God tell anybody about these men? I'll tell you what he said. God appoints leaders. God does. See, all those people who liked Obama hated Trump. How can they? You can't do that. Because God appoints leaders. God appoints leaders. And if God appoints leaders, if his word be true, then Obama and Trump were appointed by the living God for this nation, for his purpose, not for yours and not for mine, but for God's purpose. Do you see how drunken we can become forgetting scripture when something happens in the world that goes through the grapevine, gets set on fire, and everybody starts bringing up their own paradigm about it, a great evil. They were only obstacles because something greater is coming. And those people who can't get over Obama and Trump, they will never, they, they don't have a chance against the Antichrist. They don't have a chance. If they can be consumed by those two characters, even by Biden, they have no chance against the Antichrist. If those men can bring an evil out of people, what do you think the Antichrist is going to do? I tried my hardest to say that as much as I could during the entire presidency of Obama. And I warned people about what was coming. And it came, and nobody listened. See, the people, what did the, what did the Republicans say about the Democrats to Obama? They said, look, they're, they're worshiping him like a god. And then guess what the Lord did? The Lord said, okay, I'm going to give the other side exactly what it wants. And they got Trump, whom they did not trust in the beginning, but now they praise him like he's a deity. God did both groups the exact same way, and they can't see it. Why? Because they want to be right. Flesh wants to be right. Because they want their paradigm to come true. You have people worshiping these guys. And I'm telling you right now, they have no chance against the real Antichrist. That most certainly will come. So all those people who sit there and say, I'm not going to follow the beast. Yes, they will. They're going to bow down and praise him. The same way they're doing these two men, these two presidents, they will do to the Antichrist. And those who have spiritual eyes will see it finding themselves unable to do anything about the praise people are giving these figures. Get ready for that. It's coming. There will only be a remnant after all is said and done. God warned countless generations about this. You know what Ezekiel spoke about this time? You know what Isaiah spoke about this time? All those guys back there thousands of years ago spoke about this time. It's the most trying time 
in the existence of earth. What did the Messiah say? There was no other time like it, nor will be. And you're living in those times, and every day it speeds up. The arrival of the one is coming. That door is going to be opened. Nothing will halt it. And people will not be ready, because they're not ready now, and they refuse to be ready. So long as any of you wants to be right, you will never be ready. Only those who truly surrender to Christ will be kept by him. But those who are trying to be right are going to fall away from him. This beast will edify man's moves right before it devours man. These spirits are incarnate, walking this earth. People are dealing with powers they never thought they would deal with. They have no idea. And if that earthquake had not been printed, people would not have known there was an earthquake. Neither will they know, lest somebody tell them, who these incarnate spirits actually are. The same way they could not discern the happenings on the earth, they won't discern what's already walking among us. You've already entered a door. Souls are being claimed right now. But there's a mechanism fighting your discernment, causing you to think it's just another day, and it is not. It most certainly is not. Every single day, sacrifices are happening from very dark realms. Now is the time to reground ourselves big time and fast because the situations in the world are going to overwhelm everybody, not just a few. And you're not meant to go through what the world's going to go through, but God was quite clear, wasn't he? He warned us to come out of her. Be not partakers of her sin, that you won't partake of her plagues. Those who join themselves with the world will endure what the world endures. It doesn't matter who you are and what you believe. You join yourself with the world and what they're doing. You will pay the penalty. The Lord called us out of that, didn't he? Not one prophecy is going to fail, not one. It's going to be hard for people to interpret. It's almost like people can't keep all prophecy in context right now, but it's coming. People will look at Jerusalem and say, I can't believe Jerusalem fell like that. That's what they'll say, but it's in prophecy. And they won't even know why. They won't know why it's important that Jerusalem is trampled underfoot. They'll forget what God said and what he was actually doing. How that he draws people out in the lusts of their flesh. And he'll always give them an example utilizing his own to do it. Satan was always drawn out by the saints. Satan was never drawn out by Satan. And God does this because all those with who agree with Satan often come out with Satan. And they will gloat over Israel and say, see, where's the promise of us coming now? They're blown up. They're taken over. How can their God be real? And in that moment, people will begin to believe that. And then the day will come when they would wish they had never been born. You're at the door. The end times, people want giants to pop out somewhere, right? So that everybody can say, ah, oh, the giants. Okay, now the end times have come. Now they've come. They need something to identify the end times. But if the giants walk the earth right now, that's not going to change a thing. It's not going to change a person's perspective. Worse than giants have already come. We just accommodate the new change and keep going. Vile people have come into this earth. And people give them a pass. They adapt and keep living. Why send a giant? People would only get used to them and keep doing what they want to do. Those days are about to end, and a type of peace is about to be over. The whole of NATO is on edge right now. I've never known NATO to train so vigorously. And it's been demanded of NATO that 24-hour training cycles continue. And they only started last week. They're nervous right now. They're nervous. And you better believe the USA is not going to be spared this time. I know people would like to believe differently. But God has blessed us for a long time. And look at how we have repaid him. A lot of the body of Christ has been either distracted by prosperity or they have joined into the voices of the world to begin to persecute people. The body is no longer talking about forgiveness. The body is no longer interceding but desiring to change policy for their own benefit. And if that continues, there'll be nobody left. Not one that we truly recognize, just as democracy has shifted into something unrecognizable. So will the body of Christ if left unchecked. We think the body of Christ is everybody who calls themselves a Christian wrong. The body of Christ is what Christ names his body to be. I'm not a Christian because I name myself a Christian. I am only a Christian. If the Messiah says I'm a Christian, I can title myself all day. That doesn't mean that's what I am. 
Only the Messiah can name who his church is, and he will name the individuals in his church. We don't have that authority, nor do we have the mind to do that. What do you think the Bible says? We ought to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We become quite emboldened and brazen behind the surety of our own salvation based on our own standards to the point where hardly anybody fears the Lord anymore. Those days will quickly change. That's why calamity has to come, because if it does not come, who's going to wake up? Who's going to consider the truth of the Messiah's words? We consider it by the ear, but we still walk in our own ways, and we know this. We may fool each other. We will never fool the Most High. He knows what we're doing. He's given all of us a call to come home. We're responsible for answering that call or not. Nobody can force you to answer it. It must be done by you. You cannot answer that call for somebody else. Each of us must answer that call. And when we answer that call, we'll do so by the way we live our lives. We can talk all day. It's how we live. The evidence of our lives is what the Lord sees. The fruit of our lives is what we yield. The Lord is watching the truth of us. And somehow many of us have deceived ourselves, convincing ourselves that somehow, no matter what we do, we're going to make it wrong. That's wrong. Only when we're sincere. And if we don't become mindful about the framework of the world, the traps of this world, the programming of this world, then we'll become elements of this world, advocates of the world, speaking about Christianity. But our hearts and our lives will be far from anything that even looks like Christianity. The Bible it says faith without works is dead. We talk a lot, yes, but what are we living? How do we live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis? Do we continue to give ourselves excuses? Or are we actually reaching for a higher standard every day of our lives? Because when the troubles come, that's when we discover who we actually are. Those who panic, your trust was not really established. It'll be a good time to get that established. Utilize these days and refine yourselves. Purge yourselves as much as possible. Our faith is always going to be tried. Never fall apart because of that. But seek to see things in truth, not through the filters of the world. That's how you utilize what God has given you. And speaking of that, everything you have in your possession, is it truly for the kingdom or for you? Think about it. You, only you can answer that. Nobody can judge you on that. Only you can answer that. I'm saying that because of this. We already know we have lots of distractions. We already know that we have lots of things that compete in our hearts. Some people can't give their whole heart over to the living God because it's divided. Time to make some changes, some real changes before it's too late. I said before, many people want giants to walk the earth so they can identify when the time comes, so they can start giving up things and this, that, and the other. Haven't you noticed that even in the reading of the Word of God that a lot of things in these end times come by way of the spirits that are inhabiting people? When you see the manifestation of things, it's too late. Right now, giants are walking in the earth, detestable things. This earth is very dark, and it's getting darker. Reality will soon reflect just how dark it truly is. People will be scared. Lives will be lost. But right now is your opportunity. Before anything ever happens, out of the genuineness of your heart to truly take those steps towards the Messiah, to reroute yourself in the Lord's words, because when you see things, it's going to be too late. You're going to find yourself without oil. And that would be a travesty. Now is the time for true preparation. Not to impress each other, but to edify one another in the truth you seek to follow. Not to force the word of God upon anybody, but to be effective. Compliment the truth somebody desires to know, but never seek to tell anybody anything. Did you know that the Lord comes to those who are coming to him? He initializes the call by way of the soul. It's up to the person to answer. But when a person desires to go deeper with the Lord, the Lord gets close to them. So Christ and our Father, they work by way of a genuineness. They're not forcing anybody to go to the kingdom. And nobody will be forced. It's all by choice. It's what you choose. What you really choose. You have that power to initialize that. And if you're tired of your life, if you're tired of being numb, tired of being behind bars, in prison, even when you're free, you're in bondage. You want that truly broken? Make a conscious decision today. But understand something. Time is incredibly short. And although it cannot be perceived, a massive, massive change is already on its way. A devastating change. Things are 
coming and forming that will try the best of us. Now is the genuine time. And if you find yourself doing something you thought you'd never do, that's when you take it to the Lord and say, Lord, there it is, the roots of it have been exposed. Pull it out. I don't want it. Because many of you, you hate the wicked that you do. How can that be possible? How can a person hate the wicked they do? That's the Lord's gifting in your life. And listen, once he uproots those things out of us and we no longer seek to follow the world anymore, that's when your gifts are going to be seen by you. That's when you utilize. Your discernment will be back. That fire will be back. Your sight will be back. Your hearing will be back. You will not be alone, not ever. If you feel alone right now, it's because you can't hear and you can't see. The truth is you're never alone. So why would a person feel alone? Because they're relying upon the flesh only. And when they start talking, when people start talking the spiritual things, that's still an illusion to those who operate by the flesh. You don't want that to be an illusion. You want that to be a reality. All things that you can touch, that you can see, are subject to change based upon decisions made in the spiritual realm. So in reality, this reality that you live in is a dream in the spiritual realm. Is the absolute. The spiritual realm is the unchanging realm. This realm changes based upon spiritual spiritual decisions. And God put an authority in you. The authority to have the word. To alter everything in this realm. To walk above everything that people would call impossible. But that will never happen. If all you trust is bound in the world. The key is to through authenticity go to the Messiah. Not to fight him. Not to dispute with him. Not to believe in him. I mean to actually believe in him. And to believe in the Messiah is to believe in his gospel. To believe in the gospel is to believe that the people out there in the world can be saved. He didn't send us here to condemn the world because he didn't come to condemn the world. And where is your hope for others? Why is the body of Christ condemning so many? I know a person that the body of Christ did condemn. And that person was seeking to be converted, struggling spiritually. They finally did it, but not with everybody's condemnation. Some of those folks that people condemn, they have no idea that they're searching for Christ. They know how they're perceived. They have thick skin to a degree, but they regret the fact that they're lumped in with the other folks. The same wars you fight over good and evil are the same wars that these other people fight because our discernment is not quite where it should be. The ability to see truth from non-truth, we often make wrong calls based upon the popularity of statements. Haven't you noticed? Popularity does not make it true. Just because everybody else says it and agrees with it does not make it true. And this is part of the battle you're in. Haven't you guys noticed this component of the battle? The world and groups that have become popular, they'll say something. And if you're a Christian, if you don't say what they say, they're going to kick you out of the group. You guys are facing that. Why can't you bring yourself to tell the truth and not agree with that hole out there? Not agree with the popular sayings out there. It's pressure, isn't it? See, that's the very barrier we're talking about here. That at some point, you've got to break through. You've got to cut your agreement with the world and begin to speak the truth. Give it to you by the Holy Spirit. It's in you already for the sake of peace and compromise. So that you won't get kicked out of the group you start agreeing with these groups that's going to drag people straight to hell itself because if a person will do these things that we're doing if we'll do that we'll take the mark of the beast people can brag all day i'm not going to take the mark the day they say no to the popular thing in the world it's the day they won't take the mark of the beast people are compromising their own salvation just so they won't get kicked out of the group they will most certainly take the mark of the beast if they can't suffer being kicked out of a group, how are they going to suffer being kicked out of society? Could you be the only one in your neighborhood who is being forced to move because you won't take the mark? Could you be that person? You won't be a citizen. You won't have lights. You won't have a license. You won't be able to drive or do anything else. And people are bragging every single day, I'm not taking the mark. They got the mark on their sleeve already. They can't even leave their home without their ATM card. They have no trust lest they have money in their bank accounts. And they're telling everybody else they, they're not going to take the mark. They're deceiving themselves. The Lord gave us the character of those who would not take the mark. Those are those written in the Lamb's Book of Life at that time. They will not take the mark. They don't care about dying. 
They don't care about what they lose. They don't care about starving to death. But people in this day and age, they're frightened to even step their toe. Oh, I might step my toe. I can't do that, Lord. Don't let me have, don't, don't have me go through that. And they're not realizing they've already been through worse. Some people are starving right now. Right now they're starving. Right now they're in prison. Right now they're in bondage. And there's no mark. And they're suffering, yet they're scared to suffer. That's an illusion, a delusion that people are under. They deny the prison they're in. And they're frightened to go into a prison. That's a real delusion. How in the world are people going to make it if they don't sober up now? And if somebody says, well, speak something encouraging. No, Christ is the encouragement. When you have a real relationship with Christ, you understand that your life is no longer in your hands. You choose Christ over everything else because you believe in his gospel and you work for his gospel. You're not concerned about life. You're concerned about somebody else's life. You're not doing everything to save your own skin. You're doing everything so that that, that one who's about to fall into hell will be saved. Your life will be based on sacrifice upon truth and you'll never brag about what you sacrifice you'll never make a martyr out of yourself having those speeches well i gave up everything just so this person could you'll never do that because your work will be genuine and those who have a genuine work they don't talk about their sacrifices you know when people point at you and they say you wouldn't give up anything for christ but you've sacrificed everything you'd have nothing to say to that person or would you seek to prove anything because at that point you would live by your faith we still have time to turn everything around back to the messiah there's been enough play in the world enough half and half enough going to the lord and then going back to the world enough following the lord and then backsliding and all that we've did this been enough of that now is a call to go forward in christ the march is here and those who stay in egypt will be destroyed with egypt and that destruction will be sure those who look back will die as lot's wife did in with Sodom and gomorrah now the penalties become real and they will be established in god's holy word now it's time to put away childish things not to battle against one another but to go forward following christ and helping anyone along who would seek to also follow Christ. Not to be judges in the earth, but to be doers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is that moment. This is that time that all of you knew was coming. Each and every one of you, you had a knowing in you. You know what it was? You knew that one day, one day would come and you would have to walk away from this worldly stuff. You knew it was coming. You didn't want it to come. You knew it was coming. You didn't even want to think about it. You didn't. And now that that time is here, something is trying to snuff out your identification of this time. There's never been a time when people who believe in Christ have been so numb. There has never been a time like this. You know, Jesus said that this time that we're going through is not comparable to any other time. There's no time like the time you're coming through right now. That means when the earth was destroyed by water, that does not compare to the time we live in right now. There's nothing that will ever compare to this time, nor will be after it. And you are alive in this time. You were not put here to perish. Do you know that? You were not put here to perish. You were not. That's why that word failure, throw that word away. This isn't about worldly. I would rather fail to the world a billion times and follow Christ than to succeed in the world and be a denier of the Messiah and his gospel. All of us strongly believe. People around us don't understand how much we believe. Our lives don't even represent how strongly we believe in them. Some of you right now, you have, you're stained, your hands are stained with sin, but you believe wholeheartedly. No matter what you do in the realm of sin, you will always believe in the Messiah. And you know what? Nobody outside of you truly understands that. And you don't expect anybody to understand that, do you? And it hurts your feelings when people say you may not care about the Lord and you know better because they can't understand it. They don't understand the conflict. That's a pure conflict. That's a real conflict. The real question is, how could a dodo like me know all these things about you? Because you never came here by yourselves. There's a purpose to your being here. There's a reason you have brothers and sisters just like you right here, right now. 
there's a reason. And while everything is trying to sift you to go in to the right and to the left, backward and forward, stay on course. Now is that time that you always knew was coming. And it didn't come with some great sign, but it came with an internal sign. The numbness of discernment. A time that you can be caught off guard and something significant can take place. Isn't that a fear of yours? None of you want that. None of you want something of significance to happen and you have no idea about it. Remember your own dreams that the Lord sent you. He gave you a warning of these times. All of you have come through a lot. Don't lay everything down now. This is when you walk. This is the march. This is when it counts. The training is over. And the walk begins. And with every walk comes trials. That's when the strength of darkness increases. This is it. And this is that time when you really decide. With sobriety, anchor yourselves in Christ and follow him. Ensure that you're in agreement with his gospel. You don't have to forecast anything. Be genuine behind your walk. It's already within you to do it. He's gifted you with everything you need to have to go forward. All you need to do is to choose to go forward. Watch yourself when it comes to worldly events. Watch the forces that try to drag you into these conversations about the world so that you condemn somebody. Satan requires that you condemn somebody every single day. Don't agree with him anymore. It's time to be doers. How many of you know that to be true? That every single day, something has formed that tried to get you to condemn someone. You know the principle of the word is... Judge not that ye be not judged. For whatever measure you judge somebody with, that you're going to be judged with. Don't fall for Satan's tricks. The clock is ticking. The day is almost struck. That, that clock hand is almost struck the moment when things really fall apart, really shake apart. Even now, a massive set of storms. It's like they sit on the four corners of the earth and the winds are drawing them together by way of currents. And I'm telling you now, when they meet, it's going to cause two horrific systems that most people are going to have to deal with. We haven't seen rain, but we're about to see it. See, some of you ask, well, how can all this stuff come and I have joy in me? If you follow Christ, there'll be no such thing as not having joy. That's an enigma, a puzzle to your mind right now, but it won't be when the time comes. You're destined to go through these times with the joy of the Lord, with understanding, not being confused, but with understanding, not because you know all the facts about the atmosphere and about geology. No, because you have confidence in Christ in a way that you never had before. These are also the days when that manifestation of Christ by way of the Holy Spirit happens in a way that has not happened since the days of the apostles. And you're counted to be among those folks. But you will determine what you receive and don't receive by your authenticity that you have in your small time of freedom right now. It's in these times of relative peace that we choose. Anybody will choose Christ when everything is very heavy. But who's going to choose Christ when they're free? That's when your choices count. When you're under duress, it's easy to choose a rescue. It's easy to choose the right path when half the people you were with have been jailed. That's easy. But in your freedom when no one has been jailed, who dares to have integrity to choose the right path when there are no consequences in sight? People don't rob banks when they're out of money because of consequences. But who would do the right thing when there are no consequences? That's the choice you're making. You're not forced to choose good. You simply choose it. If you know there are hardly any consequences to sin right now, and a lot of people sin because there are no consequences. When the consequences come, they'll straighten up because of the consequences. But who would dare to stand in the righteousness of the Lord when there's no penalty? See, that's a real choice. Or you're not forced to, not because of consequences, but because of your true faith, you choose the Lord's way. It shouldn't take consequences to cause us to choose the good. Now is a moment you can define things in your life before consequences ever come, before calamities truly take hold. Now is the time to establish your answer to the Most High. Because I'll tell you, people will be fooled when the trouble comes because it will seem like everybody will try choosing the Lord. Now after a time when they still continue to fall, they'll give up on that and try something else. That's how people do. 
as a last resort, they're going to try Christ. I don't know about you, but he's the first one I'm going to. And he's also the last one. So that decision I make today, I make tomorrow too. But people do not have time. This they'll see painfully and find out painfully. Because their discernment is not working in this area. They don't discern it right now. They're not going to discern it when it comes. Things are already forming. And there's not one word about it. Be authentic about your decisions so that you can wake up and your discernment comes right back to life. The only reason it's numbed down is because of what we're ingesting of the world. We've gotten too much of the world in us. It is stifling the truth 